welcome everyone. For those of you who don't know uh, me or who hasn't had a chance to meet me yet, my name is Christopher Kinsinger. I'm the National Director of the Runny Mead Society. Uh, this is a very special event today. It's being hosted by our University of Saskatchewan chapter, and there are students who are at the University of Saskatchewan assembled in a classroom to watch this lecture, but it's also a live streamed lecture. And we have others joining us remotely from across Canada. And we're joined today by Justice Peter Lowers of the Ontario Court of Appeal, who is going to be giving a lecture on an operating manual for the judicial mind. Justice Lowers first gave this lecture to the Runnymede Society Student Leadership Conference last summer, and it was, uh, it was a big hit. The students were very engaged and told me afterwards how much they enjoyed the lecture. One of those students, of course, being our USASC chapter president, Tim Hegstrom. And so at Tim's request, we have invited Justice Lowers back to give this lecture for the benefit of those who are not able to join us in the summer. And so with that, I'd like to turn things over to Tim, uh, who is in Saskatchewan, who is going to introduce Justice Lowers. Tim, take it away. Okay, thank you, Chris. I hope everyone can hear me okay. I'm visually on one screen and then my audio is coming through a different account. Um, but yes, it is very exciting. Uh, this will be the last event that, uh, that I'll be hosting as a U of S student and definitely one that I'm very excited about and looking forward to. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce Justice Lowers, who was appointed to the Court of Appeal for Ontario on December 13th, 2012 having served on the Superior Court of Justice of Ontario in Central East Region since July uh, 2008. He presided over cases in all, area, all the areas of the, the Superior, Superior Court's operations, including civil, criminal, family, and class actions. He also served in the Divisional Court. Before being appointed, Justice Lowers was a partner at Miller Thompson LLP. He practiced in the areas of civil litigation, constitutional law, human rights, and administrative law, including education, municipal, and labor law, and appeared at every level of court, including the Supreme Court of Canada. As a lawyer, Justice Lowers lectured in his areas of expertise to, among others, the Canadian Institute, Insight, the Canadian Bar Association, the Ontario Bar Association, the Centre for Cultural Renewal, McGill University, and the Saskatchewan Institute of Public Policy, and he was published widely as well. Since his judicial appointment, Justice Lowers has spoken at events sponsored by the Ontario Bar Association, the Advocates Society, the Ontario Trial Law Association. Sorry about that, can everyone hear me now? Yes. <laughs> uh, so since his judicial appointment, Justice Lowers has spoken at events sponsored by the Ontario Bar Association, the Advocates Society, the Ontario Trial Lawyers Association, the Canada Defence Lawyers, Osgood Hall Law School, the Medical Legal Society of Ontario of Toronto, sorry, the Ontario Human Rights Commission, and the National Judicial Institute. Justice Lowers received a Bachelor of Laws from the University of Toronto in 1978 and a Master of Laws from Osgood Hall Law School of York University in 1983. He was called to the Bar of Ontario in 1980. So without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce Justice Peter Lowers. Well, thank you very much for that introduction, Tim. I'm gonna to have to <clears throat> shorten it down next time I, I do this. It's a, it seems like a, it's a bit long. Anyway, so my talk today is an operating manual for the judicial mind. So it's, it's, it is uh, something that originated uh, with the Running Mead Society last summer, but we weren't able to uh, uh, make it uh, more widely known because uh, I had some housework going on at the time and the, the, the sound of drilling was impossible to erase. So uh, so I've had another talk, chance to, to do this talk and I think it's a bit better than it was in the summer. So let's see how it goes. So let me just uh, launch right in then. Uh, good lawyers make doing uh, good work, sorry, lawyers doing good work is what makes what we do as judges so much easier. And what lawyers do is advocacy. My task is to give you some fresh thoughts about advocacy, perhaps help you form your, your career going forward. The process leading to a judicial resolution of an issue is best understood as a, a form of public reasoning. It has a specific context, purpose, and structure. It also has an inherent dynamic. This is important public business that we are about in the law. It matters to individuals and to society. We are all privileged to be part of this great conversation, 
which started long before we were born and will carry long, long after we're gone. It's a legacy to preserve and advance. Advocacy, which I understand to be the art of persuasion, is about harnessing the energy and the dynamic of legal disputes and judicial resolution. That energy is latent in your mind when the problem first comes to your attention. It's latent uh, in the blank first page of your factum. It's latent in the opening words of your presentation. It's latent when you answer a question. It's up to you to do something with it in the interests of your client. Advocacy's purpose, therefore, is to persuade the judicial mind, actually to do more than that, to convince that mind that your argument is right and should be accepted. So my talk today has four parts. First, the advocates, then what I call the modes of judicial responsibility. Next, human infirmities and judging. And last, the role of the rule of law. Let me start then with the advocates. That will be what you will be at some point, perhaps, if you decide to go down that road. Setting aside uh, the case-specific details, your tools in any case are the three elements of classic rhetoric, ethos, pathos, and logos. Ethos is about why the court should trust you. It's about establishing character, your credentials as a decent, trustworthy person who is also competent. Character comes out in so many different ways, from how you carry yourself, to how you speak, to what shows on your face, how you frame your position, how far you push things, all of that. It inheres in everything you uh, do and say and write. Your reputation is at stake every time you appear. I sometimes uh, say to the judges when I talk to them, what do you talk about at lunch? Back in the day when people had lunch uh, in hearings and weren't, were in natural courthouses. And they say, well, we talk about the judges. And so my, my answer was, okay, so what do you think the judges talk about? So you might keep that in mind uh, when you're thinking about yourself and your presentation. Um, it's your reputation is at stake every time you appear. Pathos is about the motivation, what should move and compel the outcome. It focuses on the sympathies of a particular matter. But if you overplay the sympathy factor, you risk putting off the court. If you underplay it, the court may not grasp why the case really matters. You need to get it just right. So you need to take what I call the Goldilocks approach. The third element is logos, the chain of reasoning that smooths the court's way to the result you want the court to reach. <coughs> It's about the logic of the case. What is the roadmap that helps the bench to get to the destination you are pressing for? There can't be any gaps between the first logical step and the last. If you lack ethos, you may not be trusted or believed. If your case lacks pathos, there may not be a judicial will to help. If your case lacks logos, then it is hard for the bench to come to your position. So let me add three critical style elements. You should uh, speak and write with clarity, candor, and conciseness. If you lack clarity, the court will wonder whether you understand the case, or worst, will wonder whether you are trying to obfuscate. Candor is about being honest with the court about the problems with your case. Addressing those directly, those weaknesses directly without flinching creates credibility. It is preferable to being harried by the court's questions which will, I can promise you, inevitably focus on the weakest links in your argument. Conciseness is about getting your point across without wasting words. So with that on the advocates, let me complicate the picture of the advocate's role with what follows about judging. Now I turn to judging uh, judges and their care and feeding. The advocate needs to imagine until we step into the judge's shoes and see things from our perspective stepping outside of your partisan position. Understanding that perspective will help you, enable you to work with it. We are not naive as judges. We too were lawyers and we know the game, how it works. Lawyers reverse engineer cases backwards from the outcome their clients seek in order to select the best means that is the most likely legal channel combined with the chain of reasoning and the most compelling facts leading to that outcome. By contrast, judges are expected to come to the legal situation without a personal agenda beyond the call of duty to reach the just legal outcome on the facts of the law and their interaction. 
Now, a judge can attend empathetically, even sympathetically, to the claims of parties without succumbing to partiality. But the cognitive burden of doing so is not small. The temptation to yield to sympathy or empathy or to ideology can sometimes lead a judge to engage unconsciously or consciously in the bane of good judging, something called result selective reasoning, no doubt a familiar phrase to you. It is a fact of life that trial and appellate judges sometimes engage in results oriented or result selective reasoning. This is motivated reasoning aimed at justifying the result that the judge wants to reach. That motivation can be conscious or unconscious. Some judges, for example, find it relatively more difficult to find against a personal injury claimant in a contest with an insurance company or in favor of an accused. Some are more amenable to human rights claims and claimants, others less so. This is no real secret. Experienced counsel know this and so do judicial colleagues. So how should judges discipline themselves against this temptation? Let's see what you think about this set of principles for judges. First, do no harm. Then do the right thing for the right reason, in the right way, at the right time, and in the right words. I call these the modes of judicial responsibility. They might be aspirational, but I don't know a judge who lacks the aspiration. Even so, we all fall short of it on occasion. We are human, after all. Each of the modes I've laid out is pregnant with meaning. It's basic in deciding a case that a judge should do no collateral damage. Judges must be careful to ensure that a decision that, for example, tweaks a common law rule does not have unintended or unforeseen consequences. Judges must discern the unintended consequences of a decision to ensure that they do no harm. We need help with this, particularly in specialized areas of law. But when you parade the horribles in order to warn a judge about unintended consequences, be careful not to indulge in overstatement. That is counterproductive. The second mode is doing the right thing. It's about the substantive content of the decision. It's about fidelity to the law. Most people would equate doing the right thing with doing justice in the particular case. That means considering the relevant rights and obligations of the parties and the available outcomes, which are set out in the common law, in policy, in regulation, in statute, or in the constitution. This is the rule of law in action. Advocates try to frame their argument on that basis. What my clients seek is justice, which is the right thing for you to grant. That's the argument you want to make. Next, a judge does the right thing for the right reason. Consider this apposite rhyme. The last temptation is the greatest treason to do the right thing for the wrong reason. It comes from the play Murder in the Cathedral by T.S. Eliot, in which he recounts the martyrdom of St. Thomas of Becket, the Archbishop of Canterbury. His crucial insight was that bad means corrupt good ends. The secular equivalent would be the well-worn but true expression that hard cases make bad law. If the law is distorted to get to what seems to be the right result, then the distortion lives on to do its own damage in the future. The advocate's task is to find the right reason in the case. And that will persuade, of course. The right way is about the process that leads to the decision. Proper process matters. A judge should get to the right result for the right reason, but the legitimacy of the decision would be undermined if the process of getting to it were materially defective. Examples would include inadequate notice to the parties or the party particularly uh, at risk, the lack of an opportunity for meaningful participation, which is captured in that Latin phrase, audi alterum partum, let the other side be heard, the improper admission or exclusion of evidence, which can leave a real sense of injustice as the losing side wonders that the evidence could have played a crucial role. Any of these procedural flaws, as examples, can impair the legitimacy of a decision. Good advocates do not lure judges onto such dangerous ground, and in fact, try to steer them away from it, even at the cost of a momentary advantage. Decisions must be made and reasons issued at the right time. The aphorism is that justice delayed is justice denied. More substantively, in the course of 
or the context of constitutional or human rights cases, sometimes the issue is not yet ripe for decision, or the available evidence in the instant case will not sustain a definitive determination. In, in selecting the right time and setting the case up properly, strategy matters. Finally, decisions must be written in the right words. There is a continuing conversation in the cases about a judge's duty to give reasons that explain the decision. The cases talk about accountability, intelligibility, adequacy, and transparency leading to justification. That's a lineup from Vavilov that you might have heard about. There needs to be an available chain of reasoning. We need advocates to help us with the words. Now, judges are usually minimalists. We're not omniscient. We can't foresee all of the consequences of a judicial move. So we are cautious, dare I say conservative, in how far we are prepared to go in any particular situation. We get nervous if counsel pushes too hard. So early, I, earlier I commented on the temptations that judges might experience to give in to their personal predilections. The picture is now further complicated by the influence of cognitive biases and narrative to which I now turn as the third part of my talk. Do judges sometimes struggle with one or more of the modes of judicial responsibility that are laid out and why? What are the forces that might lead a well-intentioned judge away from the stance of impartiality and towards error or unconscious or conscious result selective reasoning? The answer requires a foray into the psychology of judging. There are cognitive infirmities to which we are all prey, including judges. Now, at the moment, there are four distinct and burgeoning fields of research into the psychology of judging. Now that research is based on em empirical research, which lays out the judicial infirmities. The first and the one with the broadest reach, you may actually be familiar with it, is based on the work of or the thought of Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky, who explore cognitive illusions or psychological biases that affect human cognition generally, and therefore judicial cognition. Just to be careful, when I use the word bias in this talk, I mean it in the psychological sense, not in the human rights sense. Psychological biases are, are tilts that we have in our own thinking about situations. It's called, they're called cognitive illusions, but most psychologists call them biases. So I'm using that phrase, but in that restricted sense. Second, there's a growing uh, area of research specifically on the effect of emotions on judging, particularly empathy. Third, the study of something called coherence-based reasoning seeks to describe uh, the way judges and juries think. Fourth, there is research on the effect of narrative on judicial attention, understanding, and judges. Judging. These areas are not quite silos, but they haven't coalesced into coherence either. The distinction between intuition and deliberation and legal reasoning is basic in all of these fields. The principle is that a judge should reach the judgment by way of deliberation, not intuition. Another way to put it is that the outcome proposed by intuition, which is inescapable, must be tested by robust deliberation before it's accepted. I begin with uh, the cognitive science then. Psychologists now posit two basic cognitive structures in the mind. These are not particularly descriptive. <laughs> the first is known as system one. It is intuitive, relatively uh, automatic and responds quickly. By contrast, system two involves deliberative thought. Um, if a problem is too complex for system one, system two takes over. But system two is energy intensive and people try to minimize its use. Kahneman asserts that system two is indolent, lazy. We humans are tempted to go with our intuitions and keep the work, the energy intensive work of deliberation to a minimum. The two systems are described in this table. I'm just going to share my screen uh, with you. There we go. I hope that works. Here we are. Is it up? Can anyone tell me? There it is. Okay. Yes, it is. So you can see on system one is the intuitive side. I'm looking at my, my other screen now. System one, instinctive as opposed to deliberative, inferential as opposed to argumentative, unconscious as opposed to conscious automatic as opposed to controlled, gullible and biased to believe, capable of doubting and disbelieving, fast, slow and lazy, says system two, emotional, not so much for system two, it's conceptual, 
inarticulate, not so much system one, but system two is loquacious. So that's how that, that works. What emerges is this uh, from this little uh, picture I've given to you. What emerges is this, the idea in judging is to suspend one's judgment and to use deliberative thought to assess the accuracy of one's intuitive understanding, to expand reliance on system two as a check on system one. The conviction is that deliberative decision-making is more likely than intuitive decision-making to lead to just outcomes. That conviction is deeply rooted in our system of justice. So then what are the cognitive illusions to which judges and all human beings are prey? So cognitive illusions are biases in human thinking that come up particularly in intuitive decisions. The research shows that even though judges are well are experienced, well-trained and highly motivated decision makers, they are vulnerable to cognitive illusions. Judges make decisions under uncertain time pressured conditions that encourage reliance on cognitive shortcuts that sometimes cause what were called illusions of judgment. Now it's beyond the scope of this talk to exhaustively explore the range of cognitive illusions, even those that directly affect judging. I'm gonna focus on eight, especially pertinent illusions to establish the nature of the problem judges face and frankly that advocates face too. These are the halo effect, the framing effect, the representative heuristic, the anchoring effect, the hindsight bias, the expert evidence bias, and the affect heuristic, which concerns emotions, and finally, and perhaps most importantly, the confirmation bias. So the halo effect is a cognitive bias in which one's overall impression of a person influences one evalu one's evaluation of that person's specific traits or actions. This is the modern version of the ancient rhetorical device of, of ethos. As Kahneman notes, the halo effect helps keep explanatory narratives simple and coherent by exaggerating the consistency of evaluations. Good people will do only good things and bad people are all bad. The halo effect can uh, impact a judge's approach to a claim, to the parties, to the advocates, and to the witnesses and differently for each one. So that has to be kept in mind, the halo effect. Second, the framing effect is the method that advocates use to trigger, then enlist intuitive judicial responses. So the intuitive judicial responses I've spoken about are actually in the form of, they, they actually can become tools for advocates. Advocates frame to aim to frame the question for determination in a way that aligns with what they believe to be the natural sympathies of the court hoping that the judge will be enticed to favor their position. A case often turns on a dispute about what the deep issue is in the case on which the claim turns. Now, this is particularly part of the narrative discussion to which I'll come back uh, shortly. The representative heuristic relies on stereotypes. There are two problems with the representative heuristic. The first is over-reliance on stereotypes which leads the judge away from assessing the witness personally. For example, this is a, another deadbeat dad, or this is another greedy caregiver. They're types in the system because we see them frequently. The second is paradoxically the opposite. Judges tend to discount, especially statistical evidence related to the probabilities. In other words, the judge is inclined to see a witness who is present as an exception to the statistical rule. It seems that individuating evidence is more salient and vivid and hence more compelling than the stats would be. So that's so much for the representative heuristic. Next, the anchoring effect. When people are provided with a number as an estimate of some value, that number persists in their minds even when the evidence shows that it is grossly out of line. It's the anchoring effect. The number becomes an anchor even if its derivation is arbitrary and nonsensical. The problem, Kahneman says, is that people generally adjust away from the anchor, but typically fail to adjust sufficiently, thereby giving the anchor greater influence on the final estimate than it should have. Now, he describes several experiments in which uh, a number for some particular purpose is generated using social security numbers, which have nothing to do with the problem at issue. And that is then posited for the people to discuss in the course of, their, in the, the course of these the mock negotiations. What happens is inevitably the number plays an influence and it continues to influence people even after they've been told 
about the nonsensical derivation to start with. Very strange. So the justice system uh, anchoring has effects in numerous areas, most obviously in the determination of civil damages and in sentencing. In our system, the uh, establishment of sentencing ranges can be expected to work to mitigate the influence of anchoring. Someone starts high in the range, the other side starts low, the judge's task is to find the right spot based on the data while staving off the influence of the anchor. Your task, of course, as an advocate is to push the anchor in your client's direction. Now, uh, civil cases are the same, start high, go low. It's the same sort of dynamic you can appreciate when it comes to damages. And that can also be the case in fines for, uh, for administrative law penalties. The law sometimes uh, obliges judges to assess events retrospectively, which brings into play the hindsight bias. In a nutshell, people tend to overstate the predictability of past events. Let me explain that. The bias arises from the intuitive sense that the outcome that actually happened must have been inevitable. People then allow their knowledge of what actually happened to influence their sense of what would have been predictable. This has a very robust and very difficult uh, bias to uh, completely displace. Now, there are various theories to account for it. Uh, the cognitive explanation seems to be that people naturally integrate an outcome and the events that preceded it into a coherent story. In doing so, they attribute the outcome to some of the precipitating circumstances, making those circumstances seem more significant than they appeared in foresight. So commonplace example is this, should the driver have known that her manner of driving combined with road conditions would cause an injury or accident? Now, whether the standard is objective or subjective, the issue is what was foreseeable from the driver's perspective. Judges are susceptible to hindsight bias. Once the judge knows that an accident or injury occurred, that knowledge tends to influence the judge's belief about what an actor could have, should have, or must have known before the event. So negligence cases, judges need to lean against this, this, this sense of things. Now, next, expert evidence. This kind of evidence can be very influential as a form of bias because it can provide an opportunity for the lazy judicial mind to stop thinking and defer. This tendency was memorialized in the Gouge Report on forensic, Bad Forensic Evidence. The legal system, Justice Gouge noted, is vulnerable to unreliable expert evidence. The control is the trial judge who must bear the heavy burden of being the ultimate gatekeeper in protecting the system from unreliable expert evidence. This is a direction that judges are and must be taking to heart in civil and criminal proceedings. Finding the right expert is part of the advocate's art. <coughs> Excuse me. The next cognitive illusion is the affect heuristic. It's especially influential and it's based on emotions, that's why. The emotional responses of system one overwhelm the deliberative responses of system two, which then functions as an apologist for the emotional responses. This is a very serious problem for judicial reasoning, but it's also a tool for advocates. Right? What drives and underpins our work as judges is uh, judicial passion. Any judge will recognize this description. Judicial conscience shapes the images that release insight. It recalls evidence that is being overlooked. It may embarrass wakefulness as it disturbs sleep. This is the judicial conscience, the passion for justice at work, day and night. Advocates wonder how to trigger it in favor of their client. Emotion plays a role in perceiving, in hearing the testimony of a witness, for example. A judge's perceptual handy apparatus is, with its evaluative functioning, driven by emotion, is fully engaged. Emotions also play an active role in thinking, in evaluating evidence, and in argument. The evidence is that judges, like most adults, do not easily convert their emotional reactions into orderly, rational responses. Emotions tied to narrative make the narrative tend <laughs> make the narrative especially persuasive. When emotions take over, they distort deliberative reasoning, 
which can be transformed into motivated cognition or motivated reasoning. When that happens, instead of an impartial assessment of the evidence and arguments, the judge looks for evidence and arguments that support the desired outcome in a way that is not impartial. So keep in mind the emotional saliency of the case you have. The emotional saliency of a claim for breach of contract or a tort, for example, is quite different from the more value-laden human rights claims to freedom of expression or religion or freedom from racial or other discrimination. Good advocates know how to play to judicial emotions. A thinker called Terry Maroney, a law professor, sets out the core tenets of emotion research, which I paraphrase. Emotion, she says, reveals reasons and enables rationality because it relies on thoughts and on evaluation of thoughts. It motivates action to respond appropriately. Emotion is a necessary element of much of the practical and moral reasoning on which the law depends. Departures from right reasoning usually have to do at bottom with judicial desires, emotions, and motivations, such as sympathy, disgust, moral and political leanings, and ambition. Now, this is the violin that advocates must learn to play. One of the most robust and ineradicable biases is the confirmation bias, says psychologist Jonathan Haidt. We do not, as human beings, look for evidence on both sides and then weigh up which side is more likely to be true. Haidt notes, rather we start with an initial hunch and then set out if we can find any evidence to confirm it. If we find any evidence at all, then we have confirmed the proposition and we stop thinking. Haidt echoes Kahneman's notion that system two is lazy by observing, it's just so easy for us to go with our first judgment and it is so difficult for us to seek out evidence that this confirms that judgment. Haidt considers this to be one reason why it's so valuable to have an adversarial legal system. Someone is appointed on each side to try to disconfirm the arguments of the other. However, and this is the key point, Haidt and others argue that system two primarily functions to rationalize and explain the intuitive position reached by system one. He says, reason is the press secretary of the passions or intuitions. Haidt draws a colorful image of a system two controlled cognition as a small and somewhat ineffectual rider perched on the back of a large, powerful, and rather smart elephant. He adds, the system two rider can try to steer the system one elephant, and if the elephant has no particular desire to go one way or the other, it may listen to the rider, but if it has its own desires, it's going to do what it wants. Now that's way too strong an image, and it certainly wouldn't be the way I see myself, but our tendency uh, to rationalize does stem from this way of thinking. So I've told you about some of the cognitive biases. I now move to something called narrative. Legal rhetoric is meant to be persuasive and what is persuasive often has emotional punch. That's the overt strategy behind encouraging a judge to engage in narrative reasoning. What is it and why is narrative reasoning so influential? So, there's a reason why court whisperers are increasingly developing and presenting evidence in human rights and constitutional cases in the form of stories and narratives. Attractive anecdotes are extremely engaging and emotionally affecting. Human beings find anything that starts with the words actually or notionally once upon a time to be enormously seductive. A judge who picks up a pleading or an appellate brief wonders, what is this case about? What is the story? A set of cognitive tools comes into play as the story emerges. Judicial curiosity wants to know the driving force. What's at stake for the people in this story? Then what is the cause of action? The cause of action, of course, brings together a set of legal tools that serve to filter the factual details, identifying the relevant and setting aside the irrelevant. But just as a narrative appeal should cause judges to be especially cautious in how they assess the evidence, and the arguments in order to avoid seduction into error, advocates try to find the killer narrative for the case. Part of my mission in judicial education is to sensitize judges to the manipulations of counsel. Linda Edwards, another professor, notes this, if the outcome of a case depends in part on what story captures the court's imagination, 
judges badly need a well-honed narrative sensitivity. I tell judges that if they do not want to be played like fiddles by advocates, they would do well to become familiar with these rhetorical techniques. And from the advocate's perspective, the idea is to learn about and exploit these techniques. A narrative is best understood as a record of a series of events over time. It is the way to hold real world facts and information together to remember to make the information intelligible to the reasoner. As one commentator says, computational complexity is largely eliminated as a problem because the litigation focuses on the plausibility of coherent stories advanced by the parties rather than on discrete items of evidence. Narratives, in other words, organize information in a comprehensible way, and they become the building blocks of judicial reasoning. So the working tools of narrative reasoning are stories, metaphors, and analogies. Narrative reasoning evaluates a litigant's stories against, sorry, against cultural narratives and the moral values in the terms that those narratives encode. These have been absorbed by the judge and are available to be triggered by advocates who use narrative persuade because it can bring about something called narrative transportation. This is what happens when listeners or readers are transported into the world of a story. Good movies and books have this effect. Advocates use narrative technique in the hope that narrative transpor transportation will change the judge's emotions, cognitive processing and beliefs, attitudes, intention and conduct, and smooth the way to success. So then briefly about stories. As I said, human beings seem to find enormously seductive anything that starts actually or notionally with the words once upon a time. The basic claim is that story construction mediates the effects of information of all types when stories can be constructed. Stories are the backbone, are the most powerful form of narrative because they enable narrative reasoning. A story starts with a state of affairs involving several characters in relation to one another who are confronted by a driving tension or trouble to address. The characters occupy roles. At a minimum, there's a protagonist, an antagonist, and a challenge to be faced. A challenge can be internal to a character inside or external, some adversary. The plot unfolds through one or more events and episodes. At the end, the new state of affairs emerges a resolution in which a good earlier state of affairs is restored or a transformation occurs to a new state. Now, human beings have assembled a vast library of stories. There are many stock characters and stock stories. Some are so powerful they have become archetypes and myths, such as the hero's quest, the journey, and so on. Some are more commonplace, like the ones I gave you earlier, the deadbeat dad, the greedy caregiver. Stories are patterns. Human beings are pattern detectors, and many of the patterns encoded in our memories are built on years of living, and they're immediately recognizable. When we face a new situation, we look for patterns that might assist, on, assist us in rendering things intelligible. We retrieve a, base, a possibly useful basic pattern from memory and begin to organize the incoming information on the basis of that pattern, which is known technically as a source, the target is a new situation confronting us. <clears throat> we seek the source that provides the most explanatory force, that has the most coverage and coherence when applied to the target. We check the alignment of the source with the target. Coherence combines consistency, plausibility, and completeness in correspondence between the attributes of the source and the target. A unique trait that links the source and the target will increase confidence in the usefulness of the source. We tend to work with the pattern that we first develop. Because we prefer coherent and plausible accounts, in order to preserve congruency between the source and the target, we are tempted to, we are tempted to erase inconsistencies and fill in the blanks. However, the source can prove to be a Procrustean bed. When the tailoring effort is too much, we notice that the mapping does not align well. By the way, it does take some time to notice that because we're we're looking at a particular uh, hypothesis to confirm. So when the mapping doesn't align well, that should lead us to abandon the source and look for a better one. Ultimately, we will settle on a source that seems, once mapped onto the target, 
to adequately account for enough of the information to make the target intelligible. The narrative construct then underpins our thinking and underwrites the judgment. Now, the narrative, the advocate's task in the face of this is to find the right source for understanding the story in the case. And the fight might be about what is the right source? What is the right precedent that applies? That's this particular kind of fight. Let me move to metaphors and analogies. Narrative reasoning makes use of metaphors and analogies. Linda Berger distinguishes between propositional and conventional metaphors, like the wall of separation, and novel metaphors, including poetic metaphors, all the world's a stage would be an example. Over time, novel metaphors can become conventional. Berger's view is that metaphor is absorbed through long, constant, and unconscious experience. Conventional or familiar metaphors provide tacit knowledge, a knowledge that has become embedded through unavoidable and repeated experience, and they work quickly on your mind. By contrast, novel or poetic metaphors take longer to process. Berger argues that uh, uh, conventional uh, metaphors trigger system one intuitions, while novel metaphors trigger system two deliberation and require the judge to work through an alignment, comparison, and inference process that blends intuitive and more reflective thinking. Berger and Stanchi together explain that while the familiar metaphor helps things to fall into place naturally and makes the judge comfortable, novel metaphors can disturb the operation of a conventional metaphor and push the judge into new deliberative territory. So the advocate's purpose in using a novel metaphor is to shift the judge's perspective, the one that favors the client's position. This of course is a legitimate strategy for an advocate. It might be the way in which the judge is encouraged to step into the claimant's shoes and experience compelling agonistic engagement. What it should not be, in my view, is judicially unconscious. Between narrative reasoning and rule-based reasonings comes analogical reasoning. Judges use it when there is sufficient similarity between the situation at hand and the situation in which a legal rule has previously been applied. It's common sense that people in roughly similar situations ought not to end up with different outcomes. The common law goes the trite observation, moves by analogical reasoning. Narrative reasoning can help smooth the judge's way through the inflection points that arise in any case, from the elements of the cause of action to the details of the evidence and the application of the law. This is its power. Good advocates are masters of narrative. So you got to like read a lot and read outside of the law. Of course, the counterfoil to the narrative can be another narrative, a counter narrative. Often the best counter is the rule-based analysis, which when well executed can reveal the story-based narrative to be a manipulation. Rule-based reasoning is fundamental to the rule of law to which I now turn. This is my fourth part of this talk. So what about the rule of law? Now, having been down this kind of odd trail that I've taken you down, this odd path, you might, some of you might be wondering where the rule of law is in all of this. You've been taught rule-based reasoning, and I've barely mentioned it. Well, the, implicit, uh, the insight implicit in the rule of law is that discretion must be reasonably constrained if result-selective reasoning is to be avoided. This is amply uh, supported by the psychological research. Human beings are fallible, judges no less so. The rule of law is quite aware, if at times only implicitly, of the long list of the human infirmities I canvass above. That awareness accounts for many rules from the adversarial system itself, which gives uh, opportunities for disconfirming evidence or arguments, to the rules of evidence, which excludes unduly inflammatory evidence, to multifactorial tests, which compel deliberative reasoning, to the obligation to write reasons, perhaps the most effective limit, which also compels deliberative reasoning. The countervailing pressures that build in margins of maneuver for judges include the nature of legal argument, the evolution of the system away from prescriptive rules, the pervasive indeterminacy of constitutional and human rights texts, the evolution of charter values, and the existence of functional hierarchies largely underwritten 
by the ascendancy of equality in rights conf conflicts. Each of these provides judges with opportunities to make choices, and such opportunities can lead them into temptation to resort to result selective reasoning. I do not suggest that margins of maneuver are bad. They are good and necessary in any legal system, but they come with that risk. Good advocates know how to work these margins. So what about rule-based reasoning? Isn't that what the rule of law is all about? Rule-based reasoning starts from the, uh, the legal rules that apply to the case at hand. The dispute arrives on the judge's dais already framed by the parties and the law more generally into the form of a cause of action. While there can be disputes about whether the plaintiff has uh, selected the right cause of action, such disputes are relatively rare. In the paradigm case of rule-based reasoning, the cause of action channels the evidence, the findings of fact, and credibility and reliability, and the application of the law to the facts as found. This channel leads ineluctably to the judgment. Dan Simon uh, identifies the form of rule-based reasoning in these words. Logical forms of inference follow particular courses of reasoning. Deductions progress from major and minor premises towards conclusions. Inductions flow from empirical observations towards generalized rules. Analogies emanate from established cases and extend to target cases. And factual determinations proceed from evidence through inferences towards conclusions. A core tenet is that the decision-making process strictly follows these paths for in, of inference. So then how do narrative reasoning and rule-based reasoning relate? Rule-based reasoning has a primacy in the way that decisions are framed and explained. Once narrative reasoning has worked its magic, the judge is left to write the decision and must do so in a way that conforms with the rule-based uh, reasoning paradigm in form and content. There is an expression among judges that sometimes a decision just won't write, which signifies an inescapable constraint on the outcome. This means that deliberative reason can find no path or valid chain of reasoning to the outcome proposed by intuition or motivation, no matter how well induced by narrative or by the influence of cognitive illusions. I just read yesterday an article in which a uh, uh, guy by the name of Tushnet, uh, T-U-S-H-N-E-T, -E he wrote on, on, on reasoning, uh, judicial reasoning. He said that, you know, in his view as a legal realist, um, any a judge can justify any 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 uh, possible outcome. Uh, the difference between the judges who can do that and judges who can't is the judges who can do it have better talent. So I don't actually think that's right because his his approach would leave out any questions of principle or honesty, which I don't think uh, uh, is something that can be uh, ignored in judging. Hence the uh, modes of judicial responsibility I spoke about earlier. So let me then finish then with some concluding comments. The adversarial system depends on uh, the acuity of advocates. Your task as advocates is to put forward the best case you can for your client. That will require you to be alert to the psychology in addition to the law. For my part, if I don't notice uh, that I am being played by, sorry, if I don't notice that I'm being played by the advocates like a fiddle, I want the other advocate to point it out. So that's the part of the confirming and disconfirming um, uh, argument and evidence. So I hope I've opened your minds and given you some useful tools, uh, but I believe that advocacy cannot just be taught. It must also be caught. Participation and observation are essential tools in learning good advocacy. You need to see some good advocates in, in action in cross-examination and in argument. That will change what you do by transforming what you think you can do. If you want to be a litigator, go watch. So what moves the judicial mind? You can't move what you don't understand. In uh, this rudimentary operating manual to the judicial mind, we've covered a fair amount of territory. Uh, you can get more uh, um, uh, if you read these three books. I've mentioned them uh, today. I'll just tell you what they are right now. And I'll send the, uh, the, the names of them uh, to, uh, to Chris and he can pass them along. One's by Linda, Linda Berger and Catherine Stanchi called Legal Persuasion, A Rhetorical Approach to Science. It's uh, published by Routledge 2018. 
it is an operating manual to the judicial mind and groundbreaking. I'm telling uh, my judicial colleagues to read it so they don't get played like fiddles. The second is what I mentioned earlier, Daniel Kahneman's book, Thinking Fast and Slow, famous book, 2011. Uh, you can find it all over the place. And the next one is uh, the most recent effort by Kahneman called um, uh, a Noise, A Flaw in Human Judgment. He's written this with uh, uh, Oliver Sibony and Cass Sunstein, 2021 book. You really need to read these three books um, to have a really good understanding of the human mind. And you need to have that if you're going to be a good advocate. Mm -hmm.